I want to thank Olafur and also the entire team here at uh, the Serpentine. You've been absolutely wonderful. And uh, let me just say that this part, which I'm doing, I've actually done in, I've worked with Luke Steeles, and the two of us worked out a program. I'm going to present the first part, and he's going to present the second part. And what I'd like to do is say what the themes of my part will be, and then Luke will present the themes of his own part. But uh, basically, this is a collaboration, and I think one should understand it. Now, what I'm going to do is an experiment, which actually I did last week here, and then I'm going to go on from that experiment, try to go beyond it, uh, which has to do with color. Uh, the primary uh, concerns of the first part of this marathon that, that I'm actually uh, trying to introduce are really two questions. One of the questions is the nature of perception, and when I say the nature of perception, I'm saying the problem of perception is how does the brain make sense of the world around us? Because if you look at the world around you, it's very messy, it's very hard to figure out what's important, what's not important, and yet the brain is capable, or apparently capable, of making it possible for us to move around in this world. And the paradigm that I'm going to use is basically the paradigm about the way in which the, the brain creates colors, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. The second part of what we're going to do and uh, that's going to follow my presentation, is the whole question about the nature of the self. That is, you cannot just talk about the brain making sense of the environment around one. One also has to talk about the fact that we are, we exist, we exist in terms of others, and how does the brain distinguish between us and others? How does it distinguish between myself uh, today and myself tomorrow and so on? Is where do I get a sense of self from? Uh, what do we know about that? And of course, the answers to all of these questions are at the moment, and will probably always be, that's why they're interesting questions, uh, in a way incomplete. But we keep on learning more and more. It's not so much that we come up with any kind of absolute solution. As we learn more, of course, we also realize how much more complicated these questions are than we even first realized. So let me begin uh, with the story of color. And I'm, as I say, I'm using color as a kind of paradigm to explain how the brain makes sense of the world around us. Now, the reason color is a good paradigm is there is no such thing as color in the world around us. Uh, colors don't exist. Uh, different frequencies of light do not have any color. Uh, color is entirely created by our brains, and it's created in a fairly specific fashion that we are beginning to more or less understand fairly well. And what I'm going to do in the experiment is first of all, I'm going to show you an experiment which goes back to the 1950s, which should make it clear to you that color does not exist in the world around us. And it will also give you a hint as how the brain actually comes up with the colors that we all uh, see. That is what the mechanisms will be. And then I'll describe to you a clinical example of somebody who cannot see colors and what we've learned about uh, the problem of, of people who cannot see colors for ne neurological reasons. Okay, let me first of all uh, say that the experiment I'm about to show you was done by Edwin Land, who invented the Polaroid camera a long, long time ago, which probably doesn't, it's, it's become a museum piece at this point, I think, and, uh, but in fact, he became extremely wealthy and very interested in the whole problem of color, and probably if there's anyone who's contributed more to the whole question of color, it was certainly Edwin Land, and I don't know if uh, Professor Zeki is here. He said he might show up. Maybe he hasn't. In any event, uh, probably in England, you have one of the most famous people in terms of color research on the brain, and that's Simeo Zeki at the University College. And uh, I think Zeki agrees with what I'm saying, not only about land, but also about color as a kind of paradigm for understanding what the brain is actually doing. In any event, what land did is he took two black and white photos of a scene in using, for one photo, a green filter, and for the other photo, a red filter. But the film was black and white. Then what he did is he projected these two images using only a red filter. This is exactly what we're going to do. And what happens when you do this, now remember, the only color we're putting into the image is red. We're using a red filter. We have two black and white photos. And when you project it, what you see is the original colors of the scene that you photographed when the two black and whites are superimposed, as we we're about to see. 
Uh, the question is why, and I'll show you why in a moment. That is why, as far as we understand it. We don't fully understand it, but we do understand it to some extent. So, basically what Land then uh, did was, uh, here are the two black and white photos. Here is the photo that is taken, this is taken with a red filter. Now we, let's see the black and white photo taken with a green filter. You'll see immediately they're different, but still they're in black and white. This is the uh, photo taken with a green filter. Now we're going to project them so they're superimposed. We're going to put a red filter in front of the picture taken with a red filter. And you can see, now we're going to also put, do we have the Polaroid to put in front of, maybe I should. If the Polaroid it sort of works, you can actually begin to see green. Okay, for the moment, you might find this not all that astonishing. Uh, I'm showing you red apples using a red filter. And what's the big deal? Okay, they happen to be black and white photos. Now, could we please switch the filters around? The apples have become green. And the question you could ask at that point is, where's the green coming from? And clearly, it's not coming from the cameras. It's something that's being created, if you want in the brain. We have one other example of this. Again, uh, the photo on the... Okay, the, so he, here's the photo taken with a red filter, and here's the photo taken with a green filter. Notice the dark and lightness within each uh, frequency is different. Okay, now when we put the red filter in front, uh, actually I think it's almost better without the Polaroid. You can see there's even, even the whiteness is more real white than the white one normally sees. I think, I mean, in a way this is being washed by daylight, so it, it's maybe slightly more difficult to see the effect, but I think the effect is quite clear that we're creating colors where, where we're using only a, a, a red filter. And of course, if we reverse it, once again, we're going to see that the colors are going to get reversed. So now we're getting green, and of course, there's no green being projected at all. OK, the next question is, well, what is the brain, in fact, doing here? What the brain is doing, it's comparing lightness and darkness in different frequencies. That is, the reflectance of different frequencies varies depending upon the surface. Uh, if you're doing, for example, if you're, you're uh, with long wavelength light, for example, red light, it's going to reflect differently from this surface, from the ground, from uh, even the walls, and so on. However, if you compare the reflectance, the amount of reflectance from each surface with the amount of reflectance of other frequencies, you'll come up with a fairly constant code, which one can almost, which actually Land called color constancy. It's not 100% constant, but it's pretty constant. And we all agree we're talking about reds. We all agree we're talking about green and so on. Even if we don't, there are variations within the reds and the greens. So we're coming up with a fairly constant view of the world around us. Now, the world around us would normally be just these changing black and white. What we're coming up with is a much simplified world that is a world of color, the color is purely on our head, and we can obviously negotiate it much better than we could have negotiated it before. Okay, uh, having said that, let me very quickly tell you about a clinical case uh, in which what we had was a loss of color vision. In the clinical case, what happened was a painter was in an automobile accident, and all of a sudden he couldn't see colors, and when he couldn't see colors anymore, he said, that all he saw was this kind of dirty black and white world. We have a, a, uh, a slide from this. Uh, he's comparing, he, doesn't, he can't see the, the orange. He's comparing what you see as orange with what he sees, and he just sees this kind of, these variations in grayness. They're not even black and white, because black and white are actually uh, colors. So uh, he, his comment about all of this, and this is what ties in with this whole question about body image, which I, I'd like to turn to. His comment about this was that he cannot remember what colors are. He cannot look at paintings he used to know. He, he, knows, he knows them, but he can't look at them. And the explanation of that is, if, you can't, if your brain cannot make colors, that is, if your brain cannot do these comparisons, 
Uh, what's happening at a lower level in the brain is you're getting these black and these sort of grayish images, and those grayish images then at another level, that is through processes we don't fully understand, basically creates these things called colors by these comparisons or these correlations I'm talking about. If you do not make those correlations, you have this dirty world. But if you have this dirty grayish world, you also have no idea what colors are. In other words, if you do not have the processes going on in your brain, you cannot have that kind of knowledge. You actually lose the notion of what it is that you're talking about when you're talking about color. Uh, to give you just very quickly another clinical example, when you have uh, optic lobe, that is, if you remove the, the visual system of the brain for one reason or another, which is in the back of the brain, the, and you don't have any, any visual lobes, at that point you have what we call cortical blindness. You cannot see, but what's curious about it is you, it's not because you're blind because you have a problem with your eyes. It's you're blind because the part of your brain that deals with establishing various correlations that have to do with seeing doesn't exist, and you no longer know what the word seeing means. That is, you'll use the word, you've heard it all the time, but in, in one case that was described, the patient was sitting around and overheard somebody watching a television, and all of a sudden he said, oh, I understand what you mean by the word seeing. He thought it meant confabulating, making up all kinds of stories. So basically, knowledge, and when we're talking about different kinds of knowledge in terms of the brain, what we're talking about are different kinds of processes and if you lose the, the ability to do those processes, which you do in various neurological problems, at that point you lose the knowledge as well. Okay, to move on very rapidly, this is a very rapid overview of uh, issues we're gonna be talking about. Let me talk, uh, turn quickly to this whole question about the self, because I mean, part of the story is the nature of what you're perceiving, but clearly you're perceiving it in terms of yourself and in terms of others. And there's no point in just saying uh, we're talking about color. We're not talking about machines perceiving things. We're talking about people and animals and so on perceiving things, and they're perceiving it in terms of their selves and clearly conscious of being an individual. Uh, what about this sense of self? Uh, let me go back to the 1920s with a famous clinical case which was described in France by a man called Capgrass. Uh, basically, what he described was a woman who wound up being committed to an asylum because she accused her husband of being a fraud. Basically, he was an imposter who was stepping in for her real husband. And she also discovered that all her children were imposters. Uh, this is today called Capgras syndrome. It's not something that's, well, it's, it's not exactly common, but it's not that rare either. I mean, it's certainly something one can see. And when Capgras described it, he described what has become more or less the standard explanation of why you get this syndrome. And I might say that this gets repeated by neurologists today, although they very rarely actually say Capgras said exactly all of that. I think there's, there are added features to it that one has to look at that Capgras also described that one forgets about today. In any event, what Capgras said was the reason you misidentify somebody that you know very well is you normally have an emotional reaction. If you meet somebody you're intimate with, you'll have an emotional reaction when you see that person. If for some reason there's a neurological breakdown and you're not having the emotional reaction, you'll think, well, I recognize the person, but clearly their relationship to me is not the same. So they're fakes, imposters, and so on. So part of the explanation was a breakdown of the emotional system. And clearly, emotional, that is what we call today the limbic system. And clearly, that's crucial to establishing any kind of sense of self. But there's more to it than that, because Capgras then went on to describe the fact that this woman said she was constantly forced to touch herself to know that she existed. In other words, she wasn't quite sure she was there. And what she noticed about this false husband was that his mustache was changing every day. In other words, she had a problem, by the way, which is a problem you see in a lot of neurological disorders. Autism is one of the more famous ones. That is where you focus in on details and you don't get an over, overall view. Her problem, she sees the mustache changing, so it can't be the same person. She can't relate the change today to the change yesterday. She, that is, she can't make the kind of, sort of correlations that one normally makes, for example, in terms of creating colors. Well, there are all kinds of other correlations the brain has to make, and it makes it, by the way, physiologically using all kinds of mappings uh, that we are learning more and more about. But in any event, she can't make those correlations, and since she cannot make them, uh, she doesn't feel she exists. And some, there's something about this, a sense of another's body image which is also lost in her. 
And to see this more clearly, there was an experiment that was done in the 1960s, which is a kind of prelude to some of the experiments you're going to see shortly, which is, was done by a man whose name is Nielsen, in which he created a box, a little like the box you see here, and he had people put a glove on their hand. They put their hand in the box, and in the experiment, they would put his hand in a glove and then put it on above the hand of, of, the, of the person that one was experimenting on, and various commands were given, make a fist, open your fingers wide, and so on. And when the commands were given, sometimes the experimenter failed to make a fist or would do something else. And when that happened, the person on whom the experiment was being done would say, it, it's very strange. My hand's doing something I, I don't want it to do. Uh, worse than that, I feel an enormous amount of pain. Now, I say the person on whom the experiment is being done, in fact, this happened about 30% 30, 30 of the subjects. So most, if we actually did this experiment in this room, probably about a third of the audience would have this reaction. The other two-thirds probably wouldn't, and that's why, in a way, it's not worth our doing it, because we could wind up with nobody having the reaction. But, and this was discovered relatively recently in France, uh, what happens if we do this with people who are schizophrenic? Well, what happens if we do it with people who are schizophrenic? Uh, they, in fact, in 80% of the cases, think that the other person's hand is theirs. And they complain that somebody from outside is controlling them. So in a way, you can begin to see the problem that you have in schizophrenia is a problem of a sense of self and the sense of self in terms of the body. That is, just as we're talking about, when we're talking about color vision or any kind of, of mental process which creates the knowledge we have, we're talking about pro uh, physical processes within the brain. Well, when we're talking about the sense of self, the sense of self is intimately connected with our sense of our own bodies. And let me just close off and introduce the, the uh, next experiment uh, with another recent discovery. About 10 years ago in Italy, a discovery was made that's become extremely widely discussed. It's the discovery of what are called the mirror neurons. And what was uh, striking about it was that before this discovery had been made, one of the questions people used to raise is, how do I know, how do I figure out what you're doing? And uh, one had all kinds of ways of trying to explain there must be some sort of algorithm in my head that can figure out what you're trying to do, figure out your intentions. And the question then became, what is the nature of these algorithms? And you can read all kinds of books about that. Uh, in Palma, Rizzolatti and uh, uh, three other people happened to be doing experiments on monkeys, and they were getting the monkeys to grasp various things. And at one point, they noticed that when they were looking away and they weren't trying to get the monkey to do anything, and they were grasping things, when the monkey was watching them grasp, uh, there was a reaction in their brains as if they were grasping something. In other words, there were neurons which were activated as if they were grasping something when they weren't grasping anything at all. And after considerable study, it became clear that what happens is when we're watching somebody else do something, we make sense of their doing that something because there's a kind of process that is the, the, what are called these mirror neurons are activated and they imitate what the person is doing without our actually taking part in any kind of motor activity. So in a way, you can almost say the distinction between self and other is, well, when my mirror neurons are active, I'm watching you, whereas when my mirror neurons are active and I'm also, my motor neurons are active, then that's me. When there's no motor activity, then it's you. It's almost as if there's a kind of code. Obviously, it's much more complicated than that, but that's beginning to give us a lead into uh, the nature of what it is when we, what we mean by understanding the other. And of course, the other thing that's been discovered is this is not just true of motor activity, this is true of emotions as well. So the old adage that I f can really feel your pain, well, it winds up, it seems to be neurophysio from a neurophysiological point of view, uh, actually true. Okay, I guess I have to close off with